So hello everyone. Um, but I'd say let's just start. Um, so first of all, um, thank you very much. Uh, I see right now we are 46 people um, joining that call. So that's that's an awesome number. Uh, I'm very happy about it. Um, oh, 47. <laughs> so I'm very happy about it. Very happy to see all of you being here and um, showing that interest in uh, sustainable tourism. So um, my name is Tim and I'm from Orcos Graz. I will guide you through that evening and um, act as your moderator in that term. Um, yeah, and uh, with me here, there are some Oikis from, from Graz and Vienna. Um, Lena, who is managing um, the technical side, so she is taking care of the chat room and um, of assigning you into breakout sessions later on. So if you have any technical issues, if you have any questions, then please feel free to use the um, Zoom chat room and uh, Lena will get back to you um, as soon as she can. Great. Um, just one thing um, for you notice. So we are recording that session. So if you don't want to be recorded for any reason, uh, first thing would be to switch off your um, your uh, video. <laughs> and second thing would be to just get in touch with us and we can um, cut um, your contents out later on if you if you want that. So just let us know. Um, yeah. So that's, I think, all more or less from my side. And uh, so I say, just let's start. Yeah, again, welcome. Uh, our topic today is dealing with uh, sustainable tourism. And um, we prepared uh, kind of an agenda for you. So uh, I hope you enjoy it. Um, well, we first will start about um, telling you a little bit about Oikos. We'll keep that as short as possible, but um, since not all of you probably have heard about Oikos, we will do that very quickly. Um, then we start immediately into the topic um, with some uh, feedback um, function we prepared for you. So um, be prepared to give us feedback and um, test your knowledge, what you already know about sustainable tourism. Um, and then I'm um, very pleased uh, to have our first speaker to be announced. So that's um, Leon Rösser from um, Schaufmann, and um, who will be then followed by our second speakers from Weltweit Wandern, Grud und Kuba, and Martina Handler. Um, once that sessions are over, we have scheduled a sort of group discussion where we di will distribute you into four groups and you have the chance to discuss about four, I'd say, topics or questions in uh, sustainable tourism. So, but more on that uh, later on. And then, uh, well, at around eight o'clock, I guess we will be finishing and the evening, um, yeah, will slowly um, become a more relaxed one. So uh, we have the chance to exchange about ideas and um, share knowledge and um, maybe have a beer together at the at the computer it would be fun. I like that. So um, just a few remarks before we uh, really get started. Um, so there are just some general rules you need to consider uh, when being in a Zoom chat room. So first of all, please mute your microphone um, during the presentation. Um, then, once you're in the group discussion, it would be appreciated uh, if you can put on your um, uh, your camera in order to have like create kind of a discussion atmosphere, which comes as close to um, discussions in real life. So that would be appreciated. Um, as I said, any questions, please use the Zoom, Zoom chat, and uh, Lena will get back to you as soon as she can. Um, yeah, and then as I said, also if you have any additional questions, anything you would like to discuss more in person. Um, we have space for that left, um, after eight o'clock today. Cool. So let me briefly start uh, with presenting Oikos to you, um, just to get everyone on the same page. I'll make it quick. <laughs> so um, yeah, Oikos is a um, students' association for sustainable economics and uh, management. That's what we are. Um, and as I said, we are students-led, international, and um, nonprofit. And as you can see on that um, uh, blurry map, <laughs> also kind of everywhere in at least Europe. So um, there are like I think 50 cities we are present in. Um, so quite a network of sustainable students. It's quite nice. And as you have may have seen today, is, I'm from Oikos Graz, that's correct, but uh, we are hosting that event together with our colleagues from Oikos Vienna. So actually um, it's today like a co-event um, bringing together Oikos groups from both cities. So here you can see our teams uh, acting in both cities. Um, yeah, and we are very pleased um, to, to be engaged into that cooperation. It's uh, worked very great so far. 
Um, yeah. So just to let you know, there are some we, we are not doing uh, only sustainable tourism. So there are other things uh, we are engaged in, uh, reaching from um, sustainable finance <laughs> to movie nights, um, like Kleider Tausch, which is like clothes swapping parties we are hosting um, in, in Graz at least. And uh, well, our students also have been engaged in the recent climate strike and so on, um, preparing some banners. So yeah, it's it's quite large and if you want to learn more about it, about what OICAS is doing and how we create impact in, in sustainability for management and economics, then um, just contact us. And how can you contact us? Well, that's the way. So uh, here are some email addresses, Facebook pages, Instagram, LinkedIn stuff. So everything you need to get in touch would be cool if you do. Uh, we're always happy to, to, to talk to new people and uh, welcome new members. So no matter if you're in Graz or Vienna, or in between, uh, just let us know, and uh, would be awesome. Yeah, so that's all. Uh, all for there is to know for um, Oikos. So I say let's immediately get started with the topic and um, step in into tourism. So therefore, what we prepared for you is a short um, survey, um, not to really test you, but to get an insight on what is it um, you already know about tourism, how far. Are you already connected with the topic? Yeah, cool, great. So we see some results um, I'm popping in. So do you already have knowledge in the field of tourism? Um, well, at least no one has no knowledge, but it seems that there's also no one who's really an expert. So uh, most of them in between, I'd say. So yeah, I think that's something we can build on, right? Um, would you consider yourself as being a sustainable traveler? Well, yeah, okay. Also here, like middle middle weight, I'd say. Um, but yeah, oh well. But also, some people were quite honest on that. So I'm curious. We will find out how sustainable you really are, um, and how to improve it probably. So, and our last question: Do we believe that tourism can be sustainable in ten years? Well, okay, nice. Uh, that that would be great. I I would like that. Um, and let's see whether it's feasible. I, I actually don't know, but and that's also very good to see that many people of you or only two think um, that it's not, never going to be sustainable. So I'm really looking forward um, to the discussion uh, in that regard. Uh, great, great, cool. So then um, we have some impression, I guess. Um, so let's jump back to our presentation. And now that we that we built some some foundations on, on on tourism and spoke about it basically, I'm again very pleased to uh, ex well introduce to you our speakers uh, for today's session. And we actually have three of them, uh, two coming from the same company, which is Gudrun Gruber, who is the current CEO of um, the Graz uh, tour operator Weltweit Wandern, uh, and her colleague Martina Handler who is in charge of the, of the society for um, sustainable travel or for sustainability, taking care of sustainability issues um, at Belfast London. So very cool team. So a hello to you and we hear about from you later. But uh, what we will hear right now is um, actually from Leon Rusa, who is not only the founder of Show of Land and um, Campus Who Care. So already two startups <laughs> in the tourism field. That's quite impressive, I guess. But also he was, uh, he, he wrote in his master thesis about the topic of sustainable tourism and get, actually got um, like honored for it or his master thesis was prized. So I think he's just the right person to introduce to you the topic of sustainable tourism, what sustainable tourism is about. And uh, yeah, to discover together with you, what are you a sustainable traveler? Coming back to that question we asked before. So now it's it's my turn to hand over to Leon and yeah, introduce himself to you. I also say a warm welcome to everyone and um, thank you a lot to Oikos to hosting this event today. I think it's a, it's a great thing to do to talk about this topic. And it's also for me, um, yeah, it's great because I'm happy to to share my, my knowledge and my experience about this field and um, yes, I'm super happy that so many people joined uh, to, to this event today. 
So, um, yes, I, um, I studied uh, environmental system science and um, sustainable management. And um, during my studies, I, yeah, I learned a lot about the impact uh, we human beings have on the environment and on our climate. And I also learned um, uh, something already about, yes, the, the impact of tourism. And um, so at the beginning of my studies, um, 2015, I decided to, to travel to Portugal. And um, um, I tried to, to travel there by bus and train. So I wanted to avoid the airplane. And um, I think, yeah, you can imagine that uh, from Graz to, to south of Portugal, um, by bus and train, it's it's a long longer journey, and it's not not that comfortable. Uh, especially, I was uh, yes, I was uh, traveling with my surfboard and a huge backpack. Um, but yeah, still, when I got there, I was super happy uh, that I managed to do so because uh, um, I got there in a really um, yeah environmental friendly way, and the trip was really nice. I met some nice people. Uh, I I saw beautiful landscape, and um, yes, and I got to my destination. And in Portugal, I worked or I volunteered for a sustainable eco resort, um, which was in development at this time. And um, that was actually the first time I really got into the field of sustainable tourism. And um, from this day, I loved it. I thought that I, uh, this practice showed me how sustainable tourism works, how good it works, and how much it can bring. And um, so I started to get more and more into this topic. Uh, and Two years later, I decided to write my master thesis about that. And um, yes, of course, with my master thesis, uh, I learned really a lot about this topic. And um, already during my master thesis, I, uh, I, I said, I'm, I not only want to write something about it, I also really want to do something in this field. So um, I decided to start a project uh, who is called Campus Who Care. Um, because I must say I'm a passionate camper van traveler. So yeah, I started a project Campus to Care, which is all about how to travel um, yeah, more sustainable with your camper van. And, um, and this year I started my own company together with two colleagues here in Graz, uh, which is called Schauhofsland. And um, Schauhofsland is all about, or is a network um, who is bringing together, together camper van travelers and farmers all over Austria so that the camper van travelers can really nice can find really nice places um, on the farmer's ground and um, we want to support the ecological farmers here in Austria to um, yeah to support their direct mar marketing and um, yes to to bring more um, to to show how important our ecologic farming actually is yes uh, but Enough about me. I want to talk uh, about tourism today, and I yes, I want to I want to talk about the impact of traveling and what we can do as an individual. So um, my presentation is uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a different part. So the first part will be about the impact of traveling, and at the end, I want um, yes to talk about what we actually can do as an individual to contribute to more sustainable traveling, to more sustainable tourism. So, but first, um, I want to start with a question. Uh, why do we actually travel? Or why do we love to travel so much? And um, I think we can all think about this question for a moment. Uh, I think we all have answers to that. Uh, we all do travel and um, I think, yeah, we all have reasons for that. Um, and what I did, I just uh, wrote, down, uh, wrote down some uh, answers I always get when, when I ask people, why do you actually travel? So what I, what I hear a lot is, um, yes, I travel because I want to escape daily life or I want to discover new and unfamiliar things or I want to expand my perspective. Um, yeah, of course, uh, I want to visit my relatives or I just want to go traveling or to go on holidays to relax and recover. And I think there are many reasons uh, why we love or to travel and why we travel. Um, I want to um, show you the quote or what, what Michelle Young wrote, uh, writes down. She is a um, tourism writer. She has her own blog. 
And uh, I really like what she's writing on her webpage. So she says, learning is a strong reason why people love to travel. They want to experience something unfamiliar and leave with new skills and knowledge. Seeing the world is more educational than a high school class, um, high school or college class. By being exposed to new places, people and cultures, you will develop a wider worldview. And I must say, I definitely uh, agree with Michelle Yang. I think traveling um, is making you open-minded and you develop a, definitely a wider worldview. So um, for me, definitely traveling is a great thing to do and I definitely love it. But I think um, what we all have to have in mind or if we think about traveling, we always have ask us the questions, um, traveling at what expense? Because this is something what, uh, yeah, what is really, really important because tourism has a lot of positive impacts but tourism also has a lot of negative impacts. And this is what I actually want to talk about uh, tonight with, uh, with this presentation. Um, so of course there are a lot of impacts um, due to time limitations. I can't talk about all of them. So um, I decided to uh, talk about three of them. And what I do, I, I choose topics which are actually related to the three pillars of sustainability. So I will talk about um, uh, social impact, I will talk about environmental impact, and I will talk about the economic impact of tourism. Um, I quickly want to start with some numbers to show you how big tourism actually is in our days. So if you look back in 1915, uh, we had around 25 million international travelers all over the world. Only 50 years later, we had 682 million travelers. And not even 20 years later, this number more than doubled again. So what we can see here is that the, the tourism numbers in um, their, their rose or their, they're rising up in a, in a, in a really uh, quick way. And uh, with this growing number, also um, the economic um, aspects is growing. So today, tourism is deemed as one of the largest uh, economic sector in the world. So it is um, responsible for more than 10% of the whole world GDP. And uh, one of, of 10 jobs are actually within the tourism sector. So the tourism industry is big. And so tourism has also a really big economic impact, which is in, uh, in a lot of ways is a positive impact. So especially for developing countries, tourism can be a great chance to, to grow their, um, their economy. Um, so this is definitely a positive impact. Um, but yeah, as, uh, as I already said, tourism has also a lot of negative impacts. And so I want to start now with a negative social impact. Um, because one big negative side effect of this growing numbers in tourism is that in some regions, now we just have too many tourists. And um, we call this problem um, over tourism. So over tourism is actually a quite new term. Um, it's uh, got more popular in 2015. Um, and uh, the last days uh, it got more and more. So over tourism now is actually a really big problem we have in a lot of cities or, uh, um, or other places. Um, and to give you a little bit in, insight in the problem of over tourism, um, I want to uh, travel uh, with you to Venice as an example. Um, so in Venice, at um, some days, we have up to 100, 000, uh, 120,000 day visitors uh, who are coming up against 50, 55,000 residents who, visit, who live there. So at some days, there are more than double as many tourists in the city than actually people live there. And um, I think we can all imagine that this is just too many people in a place or in a city, which is not made of for so many people. So, um, and who's, who's mostly of course suffering under this is uh, the people who live there. So um, I think we can all imagine, um, for example, how 
how much noise it must be if so many more people are in a city than usually. So just for example, think about if thousands of people every day walk through your city with their trolley behind uh, and that over cobblestone. So this is just super annoying and super noisy. So this is something the residents definitely suffer through, from. And um, of course, more people uh, means no, more waste. So some cities um, already have problem to handle that many waste at, uh, at, at certain um, seasons of, of tourism time. And um, what also, of course, happens if there are, at, if there are um, suddenly more tourists than residents is that the whole infrastructure is changing um, towards the tourists. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, the residents will just lose their, their kind of infrastructure. So, for example, um, they will lose their beloved cafes or restaurants where they maybe normally go uh, for dinner or um, just to have a drink. And what's happening now is that these places are just crowded, so they're not even getting a place there anymore, or they're totally uh, closed down and uh, bigger foreign uh, companies are coming there uh, to, to make up their shops. So yeah, the, the infrastructure is changing and uh, the residents are losing their infrastructure. And another negative side effect is that um, it can happen that the, the prices are increasing. So tourists are willing to pay more when they're on holidays. So um, yeah, the shops are of course uh, making use of that. The restaurants, they maybe increase their prices. Um, and so some people who live there may um, start to can't afford their daily life anymore. And of course, this is a big problem. So over tourism just inhibits local people from going about their daily business. And um, also a big problem, especially in Venice, is that um, it starts to damage the, the fragile buildings there. And so Venice is actually losing their, their vulnerable and beautiful buildings. Um, and this is, yeah, this is just sad to see. So, um, yeah, what I want to show with this example is that, that over tourism can be a big problem and it is already a big problem in some cities. And um, in my point of view, or in the sustain sustainable tourism, um, tourism should be a benefit to the local population, or at least not a drawback. And um, over tourism is definitely a drawback for, for the people who live there. And we don't have um, over tourism only in Venice. We already have that in a lot of other cities. So for example, um, we, we see that problem in Barcelona. Uh, we see that problem in Dubrovnik, and we even have this problem on, on our highest mountains. The Mount Everest is suffering under over-tourism. Um, so, um, yeah, over, I, I, I think I could show you a little bit the, the big problem of over-tourism. And um, over-tourism is not only a problem for the residents who live there. Um, yeah, it's also a problem for the environment. But it also it is a big problem for the tourists themselves. So over tourism actually affecting us as a tourist. So I think um, we we already all had uh, maybe already the experience that we travel to an, to a city and we want to see a, a famous building or want to go in a museum. And when, what's happening is we're getting there and there's just a, a big queue in front uh, and we have to wait in line for hours. So this is something we don't, this is something we definitely don't want to have. Um, but yeah, this is what's happening if it's too, ma too many tourists are traveling at the same time to the same places. Um, so uh, I, I, I a little bit want to, to talk about why over tourism is actually occurring in our days now. Um, of course, also there are again, uh, many reasons for it. But um, I think there are three main reasons I want to share with you. And um, the first thing is traveling in our days, it's cheap. So if you look back, the first transatlantic flight cost uh, more than $10,000 per ticket. Today, it's, it can be cheaper to fly to another country than taking a taxi ride into a city. So traveling in our days, it's super cheap. And traveling is super easy. If you want to go to another country or to another place, you just have to take out your phone out of your pocket. 
um, you have to open the app and you can book your transportation there. If you want to have an accommodation, open another app and you easily can book your accommodation. And if you are at your destination and you don't know the language, no problem. Get a uh, translating app and you can translate everything and you can even talk with people. Um, and yeah, if you want to know, find a nice restaurant, you guess it, take out your phone. So traveling today is super cheap, it's super easy, and of course it, give, is give, it can give us a lot of pleasure. So this is why more and more people travel and uh, the, the tourism numbers are growing so much. And uh, a third reason is that tourism now, it's not ma well managed yet. So the biggest challenge remains managing the popularity of certain locations at a time where people travel more than ever. Um, if you just think about who actually decides how many people are traveling to a certain place at a certain time. Of course, these are us as tourists, we can decide when and where we go. But um, who are actually deciding then the capacity, these are the, the ones who are managing the transportation, so for example airlines, and, um, and the ones who offer hotel rooms or other accommodations. And um, I, I'm sure that, or yeah, I, I can tell you that most of them only know one word, which is more. So what they, what they are trying to do, if, if there is capacity, they will try to fill it up. And they don't look at the destination or the city if there's maybe too many people at the, at the same time there. They are only what they want to want to know uh, what what they want to uh, reach is to fill up their capacity and make more of the profit out of it. So, but what would be great, and I think what would be also a win-win situation for everyone is if the if the transport uh, companies would just decide, okay, maybe it's good to tell the people if too many uh, tourists are traveling at the same time to the same destination. So just think about it. You want to book uh, your transportation to Rome in July, um, maybe next year, but um, you want to book it. And um, um, the, the traveling company is telling you, uh, due to too many bookings, we would advise you not to travel at this time. Uh, alternative date would be, and then they show you alternative dates where not that people are traveling um, at the same time. So I think if that would happen, everybody would win from that. You as a tourist, you would know, okay, maybe it's not the best time to go there because oh, so many people already booked uh, at the same time. So it can be crowded there. And um, because of that, uh, yes, this place maybe is not that crowded because uh, you're not going at this time. So the residents will not suffer under over tourism. And I don't think that you would decide now, okay, then I don't want to make any holidays anymore. If possible, you will probably try to find another date or another destination. And so the companies will not lose their customers. They will just shift, um, they shift them to another date or another destination. So this is something everybody would profit from. Uh, yes, same with booking a hotel room or the accommodation. Instead of telling you, oh, it's only one room left, hurry up, book it now. They should maybe tell you, there are already so many bookings at this time. Maybe it's better to, to book at the other time. Um, yes, but at the moment, uh, this is not happening. So at the moment, we don't know if it's already super crowded or not. So uh, what, we all, what we only can do is we can try to inform ourselves uh, and decide our, by ourselves if we go there or not. So what I want to have you in mind the next time you uh, book your holidays or your travel is that the time and the destination you choose for your travel can either have a positive or negative social impact at the destination. So I have to drink something. <laughs> yeah, but um, not only when and where we travel, also how we travel is important. So this uh, brings me to the next topic um, about environmental impact. So I want to show you the slide again, because what I really like about this, um, uh, this website is that they're actually showing you how much CO2 you emit when you choose um, uh, specific types of tr uh, transportation. 
And I think this is something which is really important because with this knowledge, or um, you can make your decisions. So, um, because what is um, what is a big problem is that tourism has impact on our climate crisis, and this impact is not small. Um, tourism is responsible for eight percent of global greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, maybe you think this number is not really big, um, but we just have in mind uh, that at the moment, uh, not even 25% of um, all the population are traveling at the moment. So this number definitely will rise. We will have more tourists in future. So, and with more tourists, we'll definitely have a growing number of, um, of greenhouse gas emissions. And this is something we have to avoid. And the biggest portion um, of uh, tourism uh, greenhouse gas emissions is coming from uh, transportation, uh, leaded by air traffic. So um, this is why I want to talk a little bit more about CO2 um, impact of different means of transportation. So uh, what you can see at the at this slide is actually the how much CO2 um, are emitting by different transportation um, you can travel with. So um, traveling by train is actually one of the most environmentally fr friendly way of traveling. Um, of course, walking or taking a bike is even more environmental friendly, but I'm talking now about longer distance travel. So um, traveling by train, um, so when, if you travel by train, you will emit around 14 grams of CO2 per kilometer per passenger. Um, if you compare it with a bus, um, there it is around 60 gram. Traveling by car is around, uh, it's emitting around 200 grams per kilometer. So if you are two person in a car, you will emit around 100 grams per kilometer per uh, passenger in the car. And yes, traveling by airplane is emitting more than 400 grams per kilometer per passenger traveled. Um, so maybe you know that already, and maybe you asked uh, yourself, why is actually traveling by airplane, um, uh, why, does why does this have so much more impact? I want to show you two main reasons for that quickly that you maybe understand that better. Um, so an airplane needs a lot of kerosene. Um, of course, a bus also needs a lot of petrol and, and a train needs a, needs a lot of energy. But um, burning fossil fuel in such a high altitude um, is way more evil to our climate and to our atmosphere than burning uh, fossil fuel uh, on our ground. This is just how it is. So the impact is way bigger. Um, the second reasons are the chemtrails. I think we all know them. We see them every day when we're looking up in, in the sky. And what the problem is with that is that this is actually reflecting the radiating heat. So um, the heat who should go out of uh, our atmosphere uh, is reflected by the chemtrails. So it stays in the atmosphere and warms up our planet. So this is actually a really big impact airplanes have. So but I think I probably don't tell you something new when, uh, when we talk about uh, that traveling by airplane is maybe not the most environmentally friendly way of traveling. I, I already knew that uh, also um, uh, in the time back where I still used an airplane. So what, I, what my point of view changed was when I first saw impact of taking the airplane or not, um, compared to um, whole CO2 I that is what I want to show you here now also. So what you can see here is um, the CO2 emissions um, a, a person uh, in, in Austria emits in one year on average. So this is around uh, or a little bit more than 12 tons. Um, so this comes from your housing, from your diet, and from your daily consume, and from your mobility behavior. So what So we call that a CO2 footprint. So, but what happens now if you decide, or if a person in Austria decides to, um, for next year, to use for their housing green energy? 
and you, um, the person decides to only eat vegetarian food for one year. And on top, he's not using the car anymore. He's only using a bike or public transport or walk. So what you can see here is that uh, if you do that, your CO2 footprint is getting really smaller. Um, so this already has a really positive impact. But then at the end of the year, um, our long awaited holidays are coming. Two weeks South Africa, for example. So sadly, what's happening then is only by taking a plane from Vienna to Cape Town and back, this will emit six tons of CO2. So your CO2 footprint would look like this. So what I want to show you with that is that taking the airplane has a really, really big impact on our CO2 footprint um, compared to yes, a lot of other behaviors we do in our daily life. Um, and what I, uh, I um, also want to show you the comparison to what you see here. The next bar is the CO2 footprint and average from the world population. So yes, we see we in Austria have a really big footprint compared to the average world. So we definitely should try to, to reduce that. And um, the last bar, this is the target we should actually reach to avoid catastrophic um, impacts of the climate crisis. So um, don't think now, okay, this is really small, we will never reach that. Um, we, first of all, we have to reach that and we definitely will reach that. But we need a lot of change. We need a lot of change in the politics, we need definitely a lot of change in our industry and we need a lot of change in our personal behavior. So. I hope I could give you an insight uh, with that, um, how about the different impact of transportation. And so what I want to have you in mind the next time you book your holidays is that the transportation you choose for your traveling can either have a very strong or very weak impact on our climate crisis. And I consciously say weak impact or in, um, a weak negative impact because every way of mobility has a negative impact on our climate. Only the extent is changeable. Yeah, um, so this brings me to the third topic, which is um, economic Im impact. And here I want um, to, um, to tell you something about tourism leakage. So tourism leakage is um, uh, explains while traveling, how much of your money you spend is benefiting the local population of the destination you visit. Or let's say more precise, tourism leakage is how much is actually leaking out of the region. Um, so to give you an understanding of this, I want to look with you at um, at the expenses you have when you travel. So first, um, at, your, at your home country, you will probably have expenses for transportation, uh, maybe for the insurance you book, um, also for um, the travel equipment you maybe, maybe buy at your destination, uh, at, your, at your home country. Um, further, if you book through a travel agency or a booking platform, you will probably have fees to pay. Um, you will maybe have visa fees, uh, foreign exchange fees, and of course you have to pay taxes in your country and in the country you visit. And uh, you will probably book accommodations or um, yes, uh, or tour guides, uh, and maybe some of them are from foreign companies. So your expenses will go to these foreign companies. So what is actually happening is that all this expensive you have is not really going through the region you are traveling to. So only the expenses you have for, for local accommodation, for local restaurants, for local products or tour guides, for local services, this money you can know is really staying in the region. And of course, all the wages for local employers in the tourism industry at your destinations. So what unfortunately happens sometimes is that 
sometimes up to 90% of your money you spend is actually leaking out of the region and only 10% stays there and really profit brings profit to the to the local population there so this for example happens if you uh, use an all foreign all inclusive resort and um, again, sustainable tourism, um, uh, one of the um, major things in sustainable tourism is that um, tourism should, uh, bring, uh, should bring profit to the local population. So the local population should, um, yes, should profit from tourism and not, uh, um, and not um, yeah, having a throwback again or, yeah. I think you know what I mean. So the money really should stay or give something to the region you visit that they're giving, that they're getting something back from the tourists. Um, so here, what I want to have you in mind the next time when you travel is that the accommodation, the restaurant or the shop, all you're consuming at your travel destination can either have a very strong or very weak positive impact on the local economy. And I think we should all try to bring um, a very strong positive economic impact to the local population. Yeah, um, with that, I, I hope I could give you a uh, an first insight in yeah, some of the unfortunately negative impacts of, of tourism. And um, now I want to talk a little bit more about, um, yes, what can we actually do as an individual um, to um, yes, to, to contribute to more sustainable tourism. So first at, first at all, we can use our consumer power. So um, because what we are asking for in the long term, we will get. So uh, we can ask for more sustainability offers. Uh, we, can, we can use our consumer power on politics and also on the tourism industry. We just have to make use of that. And of course, we can do a lot by ourselves. So what can we do as an individual to contribute to a positive social impact? First of all, we can try to avoid over tourism. So there are so many beautiful places all over our planet. So I think we don't have to travel at the same time to the same places um, over and over again. So what we can try to do is to get out the, off the beaten path. So, for example, in Europe, we can try um, to travel east. Um, so the upper picture you see here is a picture from the beautiful nature of Slovenia. And uh, the picture below is an old town in Bosnia, Herzegovina. So these are beautiful places and not that many people are going there. So we should try to just uh, spread the tourists all over all the places to avoid over tourism and um, just to contribute to a social, uh, to a positive social impact with that. Um, you also can visit smaller cities or other neighborhoods, um, and you can definitely ask locals for tips. Um, so about nice places uh, uh, around um, or some nice neighborhoods you, you would never maybe um, go because it's not in, in a tour book guide or, yes. Yeah. So just get into interaction with the locals and ask them for tips. Um, yes, what you definitely can do is you try to travel off season if possible, um, especially if you're going to popular travel destinations. Um, and if possible, um, if when you use Airbnb, try to find out if this is a private accommodation. Um, because uh, the problem with Airbnb is that a lot of uh, um, accommodations are only used for Airbnb. And um, so this the problem with that is that this uh, leads to increase in housing prices and apartment prices. And this is something where the residents in, uh, in cities suffer from. So try to look up if the Airbnb accommodation you use is a private accommodation. Um, so what can you do as an individual to contribute to a less harmful environmental impact? Of course, you can try to stay at the ground. So choose destinations close by and to get there, try to take the train or the bus. Um, so what can be helpful is maybe to make your own rules. So for example, no flights under 1000 kilometers or maybe only, I take only the airplane every second or third year and, and at the other years I try to stay in my region. Um, 
So yeah, try to reduce traveling by airplane. And um, if, you, if you fly, have a good reason to fly and be aware about the impact. And what definitely helps is stay longer at your destination. So instead of making a, a many short trips, try to make one big uh, and longer trip. Um, uh, so you will definitely will have more from that. And um, what you also can do if you fly, compensate your flight. Um, if you want to more, more, know, want to more, a little bit more about that, we can uh, talk uh, later in the discussion about this topic. And definitely try to choose environmentally friendly accommodations. So, for example, look for certificates um, or again, use your consumer power. So ask questions, ask uh, the hotels what they are doing to, um, yes, for, for less um, uh, impact on the environment. Um, and yeah, what can you do to contribute to a positive economic impact? Um, yeah, as I, as I already told you, try to stay with the locals, try to stay with the local economy. So use local accommodations, try to eat uh, at the local cuisine, go shopping on local markets uh, and book local tour guides so that the money you spend is staying within the region. Um, you can definitely try to avoid foreign all-inclusive. And um, again, you make use of your consumer power. So ask questions when you're booking a hotel or accommodation. So for example, what, what programs do you have in place to benefit and involve local people? Or what certificates do you have? And last, what we all can do is we can, uh, we can show respect. Um, so always think about if I'm the visitor, who is the host? So I think we, what we all can do is to get information about our destinations before we travel there. So for example, what are the norms and the morals there? Or how about closing regulations in public? Um, how about the rules of courtesy? And also, how do I give tips? And um, what we definitely should do is, we should learn some, word in the some words in the local language. Um, this is not only helping you to communicate it better, I think this is also something uh, how you can really show um, your respect. Um, yes, uh, this brings me uh, to the end of my presentation. Um, I just want to tell you that um, the, the tips I, I try to give you here, so what you can do as an individual, I wrote down on, uh, on a sheet. So uh, I want to share that with you. So um, after the presentation, I will share a link in the chat room. So um, yes, you can, uh, you can download the sheet on our webpage and um, yes, I, of course, I'm happy if you uh, have a little bit and maybe a look in our webpage and uh, if you want to, um, to follow us or maybe also join our project, um, we definitely appreciate that. So um, I want to end the presentation uh, with something I realized and um, yeah, um, what, I, what I think is, is good um, to realize. So for me, free, um, traveling is, is freedom. Um, but traveling is freedom with responsibility. And yes, I say now thank you for your attention. So uh, yeah, awesome. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Leon. So we have Gudrun Gruber here and Martina Handler, both uh, from uh, Weltweit Wandern. Um, and who is what, that's a uh, sustainable tour operator uh, from Graz and uh, actually one of the, of the major ones in German-speaking Europe. So very pleased to have you here, um, Gudrun and Martina. Um, great that you, that you find time to join, even in, at after hours, I say. So um, show the engagement and I'm, I'm quite happy and don't want to keep you uh, from, from presenting. Uh, please, the, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Um, thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, it was really interesting to listen to Leon's presentation because um, in the work at Weltweit Wandern um, we really discuss uh, nearly daily issues uh, that are mentioned in this presentation. Um, so <laughs> um, yeah, I, I was really pleased uh, to see this all in a nutshell um, 
So in, in one presentation, uh, and I think Leon really um, got the heart of, of this topic of sustainable tourism and also Weltweit Wandern uh, is talking about responsible tourism and talking about sustainability. Um, first of all, just a short introduction um, for, uh, for you about me because uh, I know there are lots of students. Um, so uh, perhaps it's interesting for you. Um, I've studied economics in Graz and uh, also in France. And I started my career as a human resources manager. And I've worked in several countries, uh, several um, branches and, and also in, in Austria and Germany. And um, I'm quite flexible. So I've worked in the class industry, in the automotive branch, uh, in software development and um, it was just by accident that I uh, started to work um, at Weltweit Wandern two years ago um, as the managing director. But now I would like to introduce you Weltweit Wandern. Um, I will share my screen with you. So Anyone can see my presentation? Yeah, thank you, Tim. Looks, looks awesome, yeah. We can see it. <laughs> yeah. Weltweit um, Bandern is a tour operator based in Graz. It's, it's an Austrian company. Um, I will give you a short introduction about who we are. And later on, I will pass to my colleague Martina Handler from, our, from the non-profit organization Weltweit Bandern Wirkt. Weltweit Wandern means in English worldwide hiking and uh, that's uh, basil basically um, the thing um, uh, we are working on. We are offering tours uh, in the whole world in more than 90 countries worldwide. In Graz we have uh, 27 employees but we cooperate with more than 600 people worldwide. So um, we really, our goal is uh, to bring lots of local impact um, to the people in our destinations. That's why we employ, um, we finance so many people. Um, we try to have lots of people on our tours, like in Morocco. Uh, we have guides, um, we have uh, someone um, uh, for the for the animals, <laughs> um, for, um, for we have a cook in Morocco, so we try to employ lots of people. Uh, we have local accommodation. Um, we buy local products. Um, we try to visit uh, local corporations. Um, so um, for us, it's important to leave as much as money as possible in the in the destinations. And we did that uh, last year for more than 4,000 guests traveling with us. So before the coronavirus uh, came, <laughs> we were a growing company and now we try um, to survive, but uh, we are sure we will go on after the crisis. Our top destinations are quite interesting. Um, because uh, Portugal is the favorite destination of our guests and uh, perhaps that's a little a bit surprisingly because it's not that exotic and uh, <laughs> yeah, why go to Portugal with us? Um, Portugal, um, our guests love Portugal, they go there several times and especially to Madeira because in Madeira we have uh, a long-term relationship with, um, with our partner. It's a family based in Madeira and uh, they have built um, during the last years their own uh, quinta, their own small hotel uh, with just 12, 13 rooms. And it's really nice. It's, uh, it's in a big garden. They produce their own vegetables. Um, they cook with their own vegetables. They have their own honey. Um, so it's, uh, it's 
it's really idyllic <laughs> and you have a sea view and um, Madeira is perfect for hiking. Um, so you can go there the whole year round. Um, also hiking is, a, is an off-season um, sport. So um, we also try to avoid over tourism and high season. And uh, also um, Morocco is a very um, favorite um, goal destination um, for our guests because there yeah, we also have uh, a very long term relationship with partners as well as, as in Nepal, for example, um, which is also a very favorite um, destination. And also Spain and Italy and Georgia, um, as well as Greece, um, these are not um, exotic countries, um, but people like to go there and uh, go there for hiking and uh, see the country um, at, an, at another side. They don't go to the hot spots, um, they, they hike in small groups, um, our groups have at maximum 14 to 15 people. Yes. Our clients, who likes to go with us? We have very special clients. <laughs> um, um, they, um, we try to find words for them, what they are looking for and uh, what we um, should offer them so that we are attractive for our clients. Um, our clients search for freedom, for encouragement, um, they want to be um, touched emotionally, they want to have experiences, um, they want to meet locals, um, but they also want to go to their limits because um, uh, we focus on hiking tours, so um, some tours, for some tours you have to be sporty, some tours um, and are not that uh, sporty, but still um, hiking is a part of the daily program <laughs> so, um, for, for lots of guests. Um, it's it's uh, going to their limits, to their um, physical limits too. And so they want to have um, experiences, they want to be touched, they want to meet themselves, um, but um, they want to be safe in a small group. So they don't want to go alone, to a country, they want to be with others, they want to be safe, they want to have a guide who shows them things, um, but still um, it's a small group and, and uh, quite individual uh, on, on the trip. Our slogan is uh, broaden your horizon with Weltweit Wandern and get closer with local guides. That means um, we want guests who are open-minded, who prepare their trip, um, not only physically, but also um, we need um, we have um, we need the right mental attitude. Our guests must be open to other cultures because um, we are not in, in uh, an all-inclusive club. We live um, we, we we stay in, in uh, partly in tents. In, in the desert or um, in perhaps uh, in, in Ladakh with, um, we stay with farmers um, in, in small rooms. So um, we, we, our guests get the feeling how would it be to live in this country and how would it be to be part of another culture there. So you really have to be tolerant and very open-minded and you have to prepare. Uh, you have to know about the, the rules and the norms in the, in the destination. And um, we want to um, employ local guides or at least guides um, who live in the country for several years and um, who are like local guides. For us, it's important to have a high uh, standard of quality because our price is also quite high, we have to say, compared to, to, um, to other tour operators um, who offer hotel and, um, and flight. <laughs> um, we want to have a high standard uh, what's up to the team in our base camp. 
So we do a lot for personal development. We have lots of trainings for them. We um, um, are engaged in networks. Um, we try to exchange with other tour operators. Uh, they are thinking a little bit like us and we try to exchange, for example, in, in uh, responsible tourism and uh, we cooperate with specialists because we want to be really good and uh, we want also our partners to be really good, our guides and the staff uh, working in the field, <laughs> in the destinations. Um, so we also created our guide academy, uh, which now in the crisis um, is uh, will be an online training <laughs> which is now prepared because uh, we plan to be in two countries this year um, but uh, we had to cancel because of corona but now we are preparing online trainings for our guides uh, we have a sustainability program uh, which will Martina explain to you later on um, and we also try to um, to get uh, an exchange, to create an exchange for our guides internationally. That means uh, we have meetings in, in, uh, differing, um, in, in different countries and we try to invite lots of guides and partners so that they can exchange some days a week. Um, in November, for example, we have been to Madeira for a week and we were um, basically working on sustainable tourism and on um, how to um, build and organize uh, your own accommodation for, for guests. And uh, the year before we met in Austria, in Bruck, <laughs> and uh, we also had several workshops um, for our guides and partners. Sustainable tourism is um, something that's in our company DNA um, because um, we have an, a nice story how Weltweit Wandern was founded, which Martina will explain you later on. Um, but uh, we are based on responsive tourism. That's the goal and that's the DNA of, of our company. So um, we are proud about our story <laughs> and um, we, we do a lot of things to keep uh, this, story, this story, this goal going on. Sustainability is a big topic and um, we try to focus on, on priorities because um, we found out that we can't do everything um, at the same time so we have to, to focus on, on, on the most important things for us now and um, we decided um, not to be certificated, not to, to apply for a certificate, um, just to have something to put on a website um, we decided to um, go our own way and um, to do instead projects that we can be proud of um, even if we don't get a, a certain certificate for that. So um, yeah we want to get we, we want to go to, uh, into other directions than our competitor because um, today nearly everyone says um, as there are a lot of companies, especially in Germany, saying that they um, are sustainable and they have uh, something to put uh, on their website, <laughs> some, some certificates, and we, we are not sure. Um, we thought we, we should go another way and uh, we should uh, spend money for projects um, that are really important for us. and. Um, um, where we think yeah, that they are important also for our partners, for our destinations. So what we are doing um, in detail, um, that uh, can Martina explain now. And um, I would like to pass on to Martina because I think yeah, we can discuss questions later after, after Martina's presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Gudrun. Can everybody hear me? 
Yes, yes. we okay. hear you perfectly. Fine. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, my name is Martina Handler. Um, Gudrun already introduced me. I'm uh, working for Weltweit Wandern for um, two and a half, a bit more than two and a half years now. I have started uh, to uh, as a manager of the NGO Weltweit Wandern Wirkt, which I will explain to you uh, in the presentation in a few minutes, what, what, what Weltweit Wandern Wirkt is doing. Uh, what you can already tell by the name is that, that it's very closely related to Welt um, And uh, for the last uh, almost a year also, I have been um, engaged more and more in the company Welt Wandern also um, as a, a, to be responsible for the sustainability project that Gudrun uh, just mentioned. And um, so I think officially, like for the last half a year, I'm also the sustainability manager of Weltweit Wandern. Um, that sounds um, big, but uh, we are doing everything as a team. So I'm um, kind of trying to pull the strings, but um, our idea of sustainability is also to uh, work together as a team. And, and um, we have a very uh, flat hierarchy uh, and try to have everybody participate in the decision making also what to do about sustainability because also uh, as we have heard before from Leon also from Gudrun it's a very complex topic and um, you have to um, prioritize and figure out what, where you really can have an impact and what you really can do um, yeah uh, my personal background just uh, one minute I think I have to um, be a bit quick uh, so that we can really finish at eight, Tim. <laughs> um, I have studied uh, communication science um, in Vienna and then um, in Innsbruck and uh, Spain, um, peace and development. And uh, last year I have also finished a postgraduate diploma in responsible tourism management uh, from the University of Leeds in England. So, and I have uh, lived in different countries, worked in different NGOs. My background before coming to Welt Wandern is development cooperation. Um, now I will try to start my presentation and share my <laughs> screen. Yeah? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. So okay. the screen, the presentation, not yet. Ah, yeah, now we see that. <laughs> Great. Uh, Okay. okay. Um, I will just uh, okay go back to the start uh, as Kudun already teased <laughs> uh, to the history of Weltweit Wandern. Um, Weltweit, our Weltweit Wandern as a company was founded 20 years ago. Last year we have uh, celebrated our 20 year anniversary with a big party um, when it was still allowed, um, and uh, the company. Uh, the tale of the company's uh, start is that our founder, Christian Lade, an architect, um, uh, wanted to build a solar school in Ladakh. That was his, um, his master project, have you got it? I don't know, his um, project for his thesis. Um, and uh, he, so he, he was, and of course he was, uh, all his life he was hiking and traveling and that was that was uh, what he wanted to do. He just didn't really uh, want to work in an office, but he started architecture and had to finish it somehow. So um, he went, he was uh, traveling and, and hiking in Ladakh and he found a community that needed uh, support in, in needed a school. And uh, so he, in order to raise the money for this project, he started to lead tours, little, uh, to lead tours with small groups um, and uh, from this uh, activity, actually, the company Weltweit Wandern was founded. So at the heart of the company, there is a social project or an education project that Christian did his solar school. Um, so Weltweit Wandern has uh, always um, called itself to be a sustainable company that uh, was going to share its profits um, uh, and uh, so from the beginning, charitable projects uh, in its main countries of operation were supported. Later on, there was a fo the focus became again, as in the beginning, education projects. But in the beginning, it was just when the partners had a project to support, somebody needed help, um, then, then the company supported that. 
Um, disaster relief uh, was also very important from the beginning because working in so many different countries, there was an earthquake here sometimes, there was, there was um, whatever natural catastrophe sometimes hitting and then uh, the company uh, supported together with the guests, supported the partners and the guides and the people on the spot. And uh, also very important from the beginning were the empowerment activities for the guides that already Gudrun has already explained about. Um, so then going back also to the, to the history of Weltweit Wandern and its sustain sustainability efforts, um, it was in 2011 when Weltweit Wandern wrote its first comprehensive sustainability report for the Tour Third certification. Uh, that was valid through 2014 after one recertification. And then um, the certification was not undertaken again, but the recommendations became corporate practice. So it was a, a big report. I don't know if you know this um, big uh, sustainability reports with a lot of um, uh, measures at the end that you have to in, uh, uh, incorporate so you improve. So uh, that was actually uh, the case. And then it, it went on. And uh, in 2015, um, the NGO Welt Wirkt was founded uh, as a means to better um, structure and also professionally manage the, uh, all the um, social and education projects, but also the other things I showed you before, the disaster release efforts, uh, there is a fund for that, uh, and the empowerment activities for the guides and partners. Then um, in 2000, now, wait a second, I can see myself instead of the lines. Oh. <laughs> in 2019, uh, as the company was really rapidly growing, I can say since I started at Weltweit Wannan two and a half years ago, the number of employees in Graz in the base camp more than doubled. So uh, there was also a need for more structure. And uh, that means that we decided or the company decided to um, appoint a sustainability manager and um, that was me. And since then, uh, the sustainability projects are managed by this manager, but together with the assistant of Christian Lade, of the, of the executive manager. And as I said, the whole team uh, was included in all the measures and all the decisions. Then we had to ask ourselves the question, uh, the big question, where do we start? What do we really undertake first? Um, Gudrun already mentioned, uh, should we do another certification? We had an experience in that from previous years. Um, and finally, we decided uh, against doing that, at least in the last year, we talk about now the plan for 2019-20. Um, because we said, uh, we think it from the experience that uh, the company had, uh, you need to invest a lot of human resources, a lot of time in a certification. And uh, we thought we need to do something that has more impact on the spot, which is in our destinations, because the certification obviously certificates Weltbad, certifies Weltbad Wandern as a company in Austria and not necessarily what we are doing in the destinations or what our partners are doing in the destinations. Um, so we postponed it, we didn't cancel, we said we will not start with that. Another question was, uh, should we become a member in uh, different sustainability networks? Uh, maybe the, um, the most famous one is the Forum Anders Reisen in Germany, uh, where a lot of mainly German uh, sustainable travel operators are a member. So we went there um, to their annual meeting and we made good relations with them, but then also decided to postpone this uh, because also it, it costs quite a lot of money and uh, you also need to engage, and it's very Germany-based, Germany-centered. So for us, it might be difficult to uh, really get, uh, to really participate in the different offers. Um, so what we did was we became mem mem member last year of the Austrian uh, Network Respect, which is a network of uh, sustainable companies, uh, not, uh, uh, not li limited to any branch, not limited to tourism, but there are a lot of industry partners from the industry and it's actually quite inspiring. Uh, yeah, they do different events and it's interesting to hear from other branches as, as well what they are doing and thinking. Um, then the next one, CO2 compensation. We said, yeah, definitely we have to do something here. And uh, we did uh, implement the, so we decided uh, also there again, you have to see 
there are so many different um, CO2 compensation uh, agencies, so which one to choose? Um, we, we went for Atmosphere, which is basically the partner of the Forum an das Reisen and, and a lot of travel operators in Germany, sustainable travel operators. And we uh, um, opted for a middle way. We didn't um, yet um, compensate all the, all the flights of our guests, but uh, we give the responsibility to the guests. And in the booking process, uh, when you book a trip at Delta Dunham that includes a flight, you can directly compensate it at Atmosphere. And of course, we, start, we did also with Atmosphere compensate all of our own business trips. Um, then uh, there were two more things that we wanted to really do. We said what we really want to do is work with our partners because they are on the spot in the destinations and they are responsible uh, for all the positive impact our trips will leave on the, on the ground in the destinations for the local people. But then we had to go a step back and we said, okay, we will work with our partners, but first we have to work on ourselves. So uh, we started a rather uh, huge self-evaluation process that again, as I said before, involved the whole team to really uh, see what we here in Graz on the spot are already doing and how we could improve. So it's important to get focused because there are a lot of, op of options and there's a lot of things you can do. Um, in 2019, our internal process, we first started with the sustainability audit, uh, which was not part of any certification as we didn't uh, opt for that, but uh, was uh, based on the uh, Global Sustainable Tourism Council criteria. So we have an internal uh, sustainability report now so that we knew where we stand. That was like a status quo. Then uh, we decided uh, that was also very important on our wording that we will work, we will always use the term responsible tourism when we speak about our sustainability efforts. Uh, why? We thought um, so that the, the slogan, so to say, of responsible, responsible tourism is it is about making better places for people to live in and better places for people to visit. First for those who live there and then for those who visit. Yeah, it's really in this, in this um, order. So we thought it's really good because it's engaging. We have a lot of engaged partners. We have a lot of engaged guests. Uh, and uh, it shows that everybody has to take action and everybody has to work on this goal to make tourism more responsible. It's not only the tour operator, it's not only the airline, it's not only the local accommodation provider, but it's all of them together. And then we started uh, to put our own house in order. So we organized the team process. Um, and uh, a second thing we did was to put a high emphasis on sustainability when we expanded our own best base camp here. Last year, uh, we almost doubled our office building in size. And uh, of course, uh, the, the building it was already sustainable, built from local materials. It's a building made of wood. Uh, but uh, when we expanded it again, we tried to, and now I have to check my notes because these are the technical things. Uh, we tried to make sure um, that uh, so the building is uh, a low energy building. Uh, we, we made sure that we have enough photovoltaic to uh, produce most of our energy ourselves. And uh, we installed an air heating pump that uh, will now heat the building in the winter and also cool it down in the summer. Um, then we also did things like uh, working on a bee garden, which kind of plants will be put in our garden that are nice for the bees. Um, and But also worked out a co concept, for example, for gar garbage-free events, because we host quite a lot of events in our building in normal times, not in the new normal. Um, and then uh, so we, we, we work also on that you now to see even if other people come in, uh, in our building to um, co to co-host an event, they also have to do it garbage free, for example. Um, and then finally, we could uh, start to work with our worldwide partners. Uh, and here also we started first with a comprehensive survey among all the partners, because you can imagine with uh, operating in 90 different countries, we have really a lot of partners and they are from, uh, a lot of them are one person companies, one, one how do you call it? Yeah. Uh, but also uh, we have companies uh, with 100 employees. So we have a lot of different partners and we wanted to see where they stand with their sustainability efforts. And um, based on the re results of this survey, 
uh, we developed a program for our partners where we would support them to improve, to even get better. Now I think I really have to, okay, I basically told you that before, but that's uh, the result of, uh, or the, the, the final uh, outcome of what is responsible tourism for us after this process is, okay, what we do is uh, we invest in sustainable education projects. That's what, uh, has, what is done through the NGO Weltweit Wandern Wirkt. We empower local people. So value creation has to stay in the destinations as much as possible. That's why we work only with local partners and we urge our local partners to only work with local partners also, which means uh, small family run accommodations, uh, buy uh, the snacks on the local market and so on and so forth. Uh, then we reduce the ecological footprint of our base camping cards. Already the building uh, itself helps us doing this, but we can still improve. We can still print out less, uh, print out less. Uh, yeah, we work also here, we changed the cleaning uh, appliances a couple of months ago to um, make sure that they are the most um, ecological on the market and so on. So we always have, uh, we have a lot of employees who come up with good ideas all the time and then it, uh, we, we see that the management uh, checks and if it's a good idea, then it's implemented. It's actually quite not complicated. <laughs> And uh, we work, uh, what's really important is the respectful treatment of the human resource of our employees here in Graz. Utrun already said, we have a lot of trainings, um, but also uh, working uh, pro projects and programs uh, to work on the health uh, of, of our employees here um, in Graz. But also that includes all the employees that we have in all the destinations. So all the um, projects for guide trainings, um, yeah, everything that was mentioned before has to do with that. And in our sustainability program for our partners, there is also a big emphasis on this, on the development of the human resources in the, in the destinations. And that's the, uh, that's the result of this sustainability program. We call it Responsible Travel Worldwide, and I will show it to you in a few moments. Because now, um, told me that it would be nice to show you some practice examples. So I have actually prepared four of them. <laughs> um, one, how did we do the self-evaluation? Maybe that's interesting for you. Um, we did two big team workshops where almost the whole team participated. We had numerous discussions with different team members. For example, if we were talking about uh, our partner sustainability programs, we always asked members of the, we always asked the product managers who know, who know the partners best for feedback. Um, so a lot of uh, meetings with uh, small groups of employees. And then uh, in our annual strategy workshop 2019, also sustainability and our sustainability strategy was, was the main topic. The result was one huge company map, like a, a mind map, you will see. And uh, also 10 sustainability goals for 2019 which then um, were the basis for us to operationalize what we were doing. So one example of these goals, um, we want to offer more tours in Europe where the destination can be reached by train. So the travel team and the European partners together develop new tours um, where this uh, is fulfilled. That's, that was our map. I don't want to explain it, just so you see, it was really quite, yeah, we worked. <laughs> Yeah. So in the destination, CO2 reduction, of course, uh, what we can do in the base camp in Graz, um, how do we communicate about our sustainability? That's a really, really important um, topic. It's really important to think about that. How do we, because uh, it can also, but I will not go into that, but it can also uh, backfire. No, If you tell your uh, guests that um, you have to be sustainable and do this and that, they might not like it so much. So you have to think about that. Um, how to really get them in the boat, into the boat. Then our academies uh, is the empowerment um, initiatives and, 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 and training initiatives for our partners in guides, marketing, yeah. Second example, um, I think I will uh, not tell you too much about that, although that's what I'm doing most of my time. Um, 
Weil das dann wirkt, uh, has been founded as a non-profit association in, in 2015, um, because there was the earthquake in Nepal, and uh, which was really devastating, Nepal being one of our main destinations. So when our company asked our guests um, to support and donate money for the victims of the earthquake, so much money came in that um, our uh, founder said, whoa, 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 we cannot have this all on our company account and we have to do that differently. So that was the, why, why the uh, association was founded. And from the beginning had uh, basically four main pillars. Um, educational projects, a, a huge education project, uh, a big school, uh, actually a campus in Morocco. Um, different education and social projects in Nepal. Um, then uh, these are our international education projects, they can uh, expand. We, we are open to have projects in different countries in the future. Uh, for now, we have basically focused on working on the quality of these uh, schools and, and uh, we work a lot on the pedagogy of, not we, but our partners, and uh, aim to um, have different schools that teach the children and the young people to stand on their own feet in the future. So there is a lot of practical um, work in the schools. They get to know different professions, uh, orientation, um, and uh, yeah, a lot of international exchange. That's uh, everything so that people, the, the children will get out of the schools empowered and able to change their world by themselves. Um, Mention with Herz is doing uh, disaster relief, uh, supporting and promoting projects of our partners and friends, um, and also integration projects in Europe that, Europe that are actually in Austria that also started in 2015-16 with the refugees, uh, refugee, I'm not going to say crisis, refugee, <laughs> in, I don't know when the refugees came to Austria and to Europe. Um, I will show you that the last example of today will be uh, how, how this could work in times of Corona because we also started uh, for our partners and guides. You can imagine 600 people in 90 destinations now uh, have lost all their income. So we also have started a, a fund for them right now. Uh, and empowerment means um, our academies, guide trainings, uh, we did uh, from several years exchange trips. That was really nice also that uh, uh, a guide was offered to travel to another destination and participate in a trip on a tour so that he could uh, get himself in the, in, the, uh, in the place of a tourist. And so that he could uh, understand and learn from the other guide, of course, of the other destination, but also in this to understand uh, better how it is to be in the role of the tourist. So we believe a lot in, in exchange in general, I would say, <laughs> learning from each other. Um, yeah, you can ask me questions uh, about Weltbett and Dicht later. Um, I can, but uh, if I start, I will talk in a half an hour more about it. <laughs> uh, and, uh, I, I, I think I'll not go into that uh, further, but as your students, I thought maybe you're interested to see how we did the pattern assessment. Uh, we did it very professionally, professionally thanks to Alina Lücke, who is maybe uh, listening, I think, because she was uh, doing, um, she's a Oikos member, no? In, in Graz? Uh, aha, almost. And she not, was not yet, doing her... <laughs> She is doing her mass. She was doing her internship. Uh, she's studying global studies and is, was doing her internship with us and uh, uh, was supporting us very, very much with our uh, with the work with our partners. And this is also her master thesis. So we just a very few examples. We we tried to find out what our partners are already doing in terms of sustainability with this assessment. So. Renewable energy, uh, oh my god, I cannot translate this. Electricity saving cooling system and so on. So different measures of energy saving, different energy saving measures. And we, we found out who is doing what already. The same for water consumption. The same for garbage and packaging. So here, uh, actually our big focus and one of our 10 goals for 2019 was we want to reduce 
or the, plast uh, the one-way plastic bottles on our trips. We want to eliminate basically all the plastic bottles of our, on our trips. And therefore we had to, we had to find out what, uh, what, um, the, uh, what our partners are already doing. If they are giving out the plastic bottles still, because, because in some destinations it's really dif difficult to find safe drinking or to hand out safe drinking water uh, if it's not in plastic bottles and to get uh, some ideas how the others are doing it. And that was really, really helpful. The assessment showed us so many um, examples that uh, now we, I think we have a strategy, but yeah. Then uh, transport, of course, um, we cannot in many destinations, we cannot, um, if it's overseas, we cannot eliminate the flight there, but we can uh, look into optimizing the travel routes there on the ground. Um, and then also here, 82% of our partners, for example, said yes, we could uh, work on the travel routes and make the tours more sustainable. So we, there is a lot of room for improvement. Um, things that are also important to us, local acquisition of the products on tour, food, drinks, tea and snacks, not, we, don't, we want them to buy as, as little um, imported products as possible. Um, and then also services, the same for services. Okay, that's example two. <laughs> One second of silence. Uh, now this is also quite complex. This is our sustainab partner sustainability program. Uh, we focused on five uh, thematic areas that were important to us and also came out from the, from the survey with our partners that it's uh, topics they uh, can still and want to, to work on still. It's reducing waste, waste on our trips, uh, reducing energy and water consumption, promoting local initiatives, um, local value creation, and uh, working and supporting the employees in the destinations. And for each of these um, thematic areas, we have developed measures. And um, it's, uh, so they have to choose where to start. And then they get, uh, with the huge help of Alina, we have also produced a monitoring tool for each of these um, topics. And uh, the monitoring tool is, of course, on the one hand for us to see what they did, if they implemented it, but also it's a huge um, guide, it's a really helpful guideline for them to see how they could uh, approach the different topics. Um, this is something we don't have results yet. We started it at the beginning of March officially. Um, and at the moment there are no tours. So uh, we will have to wait and maybe we, we wanted to do this program um, as a first part until um, June of next year, but uh, maybe we will have to prolong it, we will see. And then of course, uh, so what we offer to our partners is they can, um, uh, they can, they get us as a resource to support them when they have questions, uh, doubts, whatever. Uh, but also if they complete the tasks and show us the, the results of their, um, of their work, then they would get uh, a bonus. And that's, um, they, will, they will get um, a special kind of promotion for their tours. Uh, but also uh, we have planned uh, financial incentives such as uh, supporting uh, a, that the guide can go to a guide academy and uh, we in part sponsor this, for example. Or even um, uh, sustainable investment, they could uh, apply for a grant. I have to say that at this moment, I don't know how that will uh, work because as you might imagine, Weltweit Bannen, as all travel operators at the moment, doesn't really know how the future will be. But um, yeah, that's the plan. And uh, the last uh, example, because it's really recent, um, we have started uh, in the last two weeks, the Corona Emergency Aid Fund. Uh, as, as we said many times, more than 600 local partners in, and all their guides, cooks, porters, drivers in the whole world have suddenly lost their main source of income. Um, but we realized that although it's not um, so positive at the moment for Weltweit Wandern either, but we are in the situation that we live in a country where we have access for, uh, to supportive measures like loans, our staff can uh, be sent to short time work, etc. And in most of, the, most of our destinations, there is no access to such kind of um, uh, support from governments. 
and it is really our our um, when we talk about responsible tourism, we feel that we are we also have responsibilities for all those people that usually also depend on us and our guests. So we want to help them. And uh, so together, this, this is a cooperation project between Delta Dwanen and Delta Dwanen Wirkt. Um, and our, we invited our guests uh, to show also responsibility by donating money for those of our local teams who are now faced with ruin and don't have any income. And they really do. So we see that we really have special guests, Gudrun. They are really, uh, really uh, supporting and donating a lot of money at the moment. Um, if you want to see uh, how this is working, I just put the link there because yeah, it's basically what I'm uh, working on in the last two weeks. And uh, it's also quite complex to figure out who will get how much and how do we do that. But um, yeah, we are absolutely convinced that it's, it's necessary and uh, yeah, we cannot do anything else being responsible. <laughs> Thank you. Ah, I'm not too, I didn't talk too long, right? Uh, well, um, I, well, I, 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 but it's fair enough. <laughs> so, um, thank you, thank you, thank you a lot. I mean, it's, it's super nice to see, uh, first Leon's explanation, and then you, you, the two of you building on that and showing really how could an actual, um, sustainable tourism business could really look like, and it seems that it works quite well. So, uh, I would have a million questions, and, uh, but I, uh, we can't discuss them uh, right now since we already still have planned our, our discussion session. Uh, but I would already like to really thank you um, and for, for putting taking the effort and for preparing that presentation.